Without a doubt, one of the most lovable, delightful, happy creatures on the planet is a golden retriever. More is more when it comes to golden retrievers. How could you possibly have just one? That's what makes my job so amazing because at Morris Animal Foundation, we're 10 years into one of the largest veterinary studies in history, a $32 million study of 3,000 golden retrievers. We know as our hero dogs. It sounds like a dream and it is. But more importantly, this study will hopefully answer some of the biggest questions in veterinary medicine and help dogs live longer, healthier, happier lives. I'm not a veterinarian or a researcher. I'm the president and CEO of Morris Animal Foundation, and I originally got involved with Morris because of my own dog, Chewy. I never had dogs growing up, but I saw Chewy at a college baseball game. He was a puppy and he rocked right up to me. I fell in love with him immediately. And when his owner approached, she said, he seems more like your dog. Years later, Chewy died of cancer, and one of my friends donated to Morris Animal Foundation in his honor. Once I learned what Morris did, I knew I needed to get involved. By far, one of our most exciting projects is the Golden Retriever Lifetime Study. This study launched in 2012, and the original goal was to follow a cohort of Golden Retrievers throughout their lives to try and identify risk factors for cancer. When we enrolled these dogs, they were young, between the ages of six months and two years, and had no known pre-existing conditions. We knew their pedigree back to two generations, and we even had some basic health information about their parents. Then we started following them, and we still are. No interventions, just collecting data. Whatever happens, happens. We have been documenting their health over time with annual owner and veterinarian questionnaires an annual biological sample collection. The study was designed initially to find the risk factors for these four major cancers, hemangiosarcoma, lymphoma, high-grade mast cell tumors, and osteosarcoma. In scientific terms, we call these cancer diagnoses our primary endpoints. We wondered, what's causing these cancers? Is it genetics, lifestyle, environment, poisons, or something else? What could we learn that could help veterinarians identify it sooner? What could we learn to maybe prevent these cancers in the first place? We enrolled 3,000 dogs because we would need that many to reach the statistically meaningful 500 diagnoses of those four main cancer endpoints. More endpoints means more accurate statistical model. We'll be able to estimate risk more precisely and discern where to go next in our research quest to understand, prevent, treat, and cure cancers. We chose golden retrievers for three main reasons. One, unfortunately, cancer is really common in golden retrievers. Up to 60% of golden retrievers will get cancer in their lifetime, and many goldens will die from it. Two, they're also a really popular breed in the United States, so we knew we could hit our recruiting goals. Three, they have great personalities. They're happy-go-lucky. We knew that they'd tolerate the rigors of being involved in a study and having slightly more demanding vet visits. After launching a nationwide campaign, and with the help of Betty White, we managed to enroll 3,044 dogs into the study with 2,778 owners and 2,059 vets. One vet had 18 patients enrolled in the study. We have dogs enrolled throughout the contiguous 48 states to ensure we capture various environmental conditions and differences in exposures. For example, dogs in the southeast typically will have more heartworm exposure while dogs in the Northeast may see more ticks, and dogs in Colorado may see more rattlesnake bites. California has the most dogs enrolled. Colorado has the most dogs per capita. Our dogs are almost a 50-50 male to female ratio, and 85% of our dogs are spayed or neutered at this stage. Some dogs are pets, and some also are therapy dogs. Some are very high performance with jobs, including sporting dogs that hunt, and participate in field trials, and dogs that compete in dock diving or agility competitions. Every year, each dog's owner completes an online questionnaire that asks them everything from what they feed their dog to lifestyle, physical activity, and travel history. We ask about the health history of their dogs, 
the health history of their dog's mom, dad, and that of their litter mates if they know it. They also fill out a behavioral questionnaire. In total, the owner fills out the equivalent of 120 pages worth of information about their dog every single year. Then they go to the veterinarian and the vet does a really extensive physical exam and also fills out a questionnaire about the dog's health. Any changes from the prior year, medications, vaccines, and observations from their physical exam. The veterinarian also collects samples of serum, blood, urine, feces, fur, and toenails. We run clinical pathology tests on each dog, plus a heartworm test and a fecal exam for parasites. Fur and nails are a great way to investigate potential environmental toxins. Chemicals, pesticides, and herbicides like to sit in fur and nails. This is one of the main reasons the study is so expensive. We have to collect and store all these samples safely. Multiple samples collected yearly on almost 3,000 dogs adds up really fast. Right now, we have more than 500,000 individual biological samples and professional storage, and the number just keeps increasing. We estimate that by the time data collection is done, we'll have over 5 million biological samples and data points on these dogs. Some of the results from our study will be specific to golden retrievers, but a lot will help us better understand the critical health problems of other dogs as well. For example, you might be familiar with how we're able to detect a higher risk of breast cancer in some women through genetic testing for the BRCA1 and 2 gene mutations. We might be able to find biomarkers that show an increased cancer risk in goldens. And even if those aren't the exact same biomarkers and cocker spaniels, for example, it could still help researchers and geneticists accelerate their investigations and narrow down the search for cancer mutations faster. But it's also possible that this research on dogs will help humans too. For example, the biological behavior of osteosarcoma in dogs is almost identical in children. What we learn about osteosarcoma and golden retrievers might translate to human healthcare. Dogs are exposed to almost all the same environmental toxins that their human owners are. If we realize that certain environmental toxins increase the likelihood of cancer in golden retrievers, it might be worth looking into how those things impact humans as well. For example, we have a ton of dogs enrolled in California. If we realize that the dogs are negatively impacted by the smoke pollution or fire retardant, we might be able to check in on their human owners too, since they live right alongside each other. Because dog owners have a shorter lifespan, the course of a disease in a dog plays out much faster than it might in their human owners. In that way, dogs are the canary in the coal mine for their owners. One of the first papers we published out of the study is about spaying and neutering. And whether the age you spay or neuter a dog impacts obesity or orthopedic injuries like cruciate ligament ruptures, for decades, the prevailing mindset among veterinarians was that you should spay or neuter your dog as soon as possible. Younger was better. But recently, there's been a debate among veterinarians about whether you should wait, specifically in large breed dogs, until they're older. So we looked at the data points we collected so far in the study, and we confirmed that spaying and neutering is a risk factor for obesity, and dogs that were spayed or neutered at a younger age, earlier than six months, had the highest risk for orthopedic injuries. Even if your dog isn't obese, if they're in that youngest age category when they're spayed or neutered, they're at a higher risk for orthopedic injuries compared to their friends who were spayed or neutered later or who are still intact. It was fascinating to see that there's such a strong association between losing those reproductive hormones and having orthopedic injuries. A strong hypothesis is that it is because reproductive hormones are so important for developing tendon and ligament integrity and muscle strength. There's also some evidence that early spay or neuter delays growth plate closure, which affects the joints and predisposes dogs to these injuries. With this information, veterinarians can have a more nuanced conversation about spay and neuter with their clients. It's no longer just, are you going to breed this dog? No, okay, let's spay it right now. It's a matter of weighing these options, the risks 
and making a more informed decision for the client. This is just one published paper from the study, but it has so much potential to help prevent or reduce the incidence of obesity and orthopedic injuries in dogs. With 5 million data points, there's an infinite list of things we could look at, and quite a number of studies are already underway. In the last year, we put out a third call for proposals to use our samples and data sets. So far, dozens of research institutions, veterinary corporations, and individual scientists have submitted proposals looking at everything from transmission of COVID-19 from owners to their dogs, to whether a dog's gut bacteria called the microbiome change prior to a cancer diagnosis. We're trying to maximize the samples as much as possible so that we can learn as much as possible about as many different topics to move forward faster in canine health. For example, two new partnerships are helping us do a deeper dive into critical health areas that impact almost every dog. We are partnering with the Purina Institute on a canine cognitive dysfunction syndrome study. This syndrome is similar to cognitive decline or Alzheimer's disease in people as we age. Our golden retrievers are a great model to not only understand what is happening behaviorally and physically in dogs as they age, but if there's something dog owners can do to prevent or delay the onset of cognitive dysfunction. I've talked with dog owners who share their concerns about their aging dogs and the behavior changes they are seeing from staring at walls to toileting behaviors to sleep disturbances. And these are all common problems. This study will shed light on how we can help our senior dogs have longer health spans, not just life spans. With Elanco, we're looking at detecting osteoarthritis, which many people assume is a disease affecting joint health and movement of older dogs. It is now known that osteoarthritis usually starts in young dogs and is highly treatable through lifestyle change and medication when needed. This study is showing us how to use new tools to more easily spot osteoarthritis and how we might begin intervention earlier to keep our dogs running, jumping, playing fetch for more years and avoid serious issues when they are seniors. The amazing thing about the Golden Retriever Lifetime Study is the data will be here for decades to come, a rich source of longitudinal data sets that can inform many health studies and be used as source material for an almost infinite number of questions. That's exciting for researchers and dog owners alike. One of the most surprising and heartwarming outcomes of the study so far is the community and camaraderie among the hero dog owners. The participants created their own Facebook group in 2014, 3,000 strong community group, and it's become an incredible source of information, encouragement, problem solving, and care. They also support each other in times of need, even when it's the owners who are diagnosed with cancer or suffer tragedy in their human community. Sadly, almost 550 of our dogs have passed away during the course of the study to date. The average participant is now eight years old and most Goldens only live to 10 or 12. But the Facebook group has become a place for owners to honor and celebrate those dogs that have passed. It's a way to recognize their contributions to science and the legacy of that. And a way for their owners to stay engaged with the community even after their dogs are gone. We recently asked the community what they've learned from the study and why they stay engaged. Of course, they told us that they were committed to finding solutions to cancer in dogs, and that a huge motivating factor was to find solutions for human health too, but that it wasn't just about the science, it was about the community, especially when the worst happened. The Golden Retriever Lifetime Study has become something bigger than we expected. It was no longer our study, but the study and their community too. This collaboration between scientists and citizens is so powerful. And since COVID-19 put science in the spotlight, I think it will become increasingly common. For years, we've debated about how to get more kids involved in STEM, about how to make science more interesting to lay people. But science is so interesting, especially when it's relevant to your daily life. It's the absolute love and devotion our participants have for the Goldens that makes this study possible. It's the hard work and dedication of thousands of veterinarians, of researchers, corporations, and institutions. 
This is the largest study of its kind in history, and it couldn't happen without the dedication of thousands of people. My hope is that studies like the Golden Retriever Lifetime Study will show that everyday people, many of them non-scientists, can make a huge difference in the lives of their pets. And that together, we can find solutions to the most pressing problems and create a better world for us all. Thank you.